Hello everyone, welcome back to episode 18 of Night Call, and we are going to look at our new evidence that we got when we got home in the last episode. So, what do we have here? We have new case files, Chris's criminal records, okay. So what do we want to know first? Okay, um, I think I want to know, go for the killer case first. And then, so, I don't know. It just feels like Chris is thrown in there as someone who's not involved in all of this. And, ooh, okay, so we know something about the killer. Okay, yeah, so Chris is kind of in the clear. But taller than 175. But we also learned that, okay, death by injection of muscle relaxant leading to asphyxia. And her husband is a dentist with access to muscle relaxant. Okay. Well, that sounds awfully convenient for her, huh? I thought that you were just a business shark lady, but maybe you're a jerk too. I don't know. And yeah, Geraldine, that was her. And we also could have driven her. Geraldine lost her company to Group Diamant because she fired her. And the victims were surprised by the injection. What we read in the paper is that because of a murder case, the testament or something was frozen. So the heirs didn't get anything until the murder case is solved. So it wouldn't make any sense to kill the fourth victim for her because she wouldn't get any money if she knew that. So we have to, yeah, we have victim four here and we also have victim three. Those are really long. Um, I'm just gonna go with victim four, the police report. Let's see what that gives us. Ooh, five new clues. The Albatross fire pushed victim four to sell shares. Okay, and she's just connected to victim four because she's the heir. Victim four changed will two days before death. But to what? Victim four banknotes stuffed in the throat. Death by injection of muscle relaxant, we don't know that. Camille heir to victims for a fortune. Yeah, we already knew that. Weapon used on you was a World War II gun. How did we acquire that from victim number four police report? We can't be victim number... Okay. Oh, maybe because the victim number four was shot with a World War II gun. But the death by injection of the muscle relaxant, was it really for everyone? Because why did everyone get killed by muscle relaxant and then we just got shot with a gun? Muscle relaxant pancuronium bromide. So now it's the question if this is something that is used by a dentist. Will we find out here? Do I have to Google it? I don't know. Maybe I will Google it. Geraldine lost her company to Group Diamant. Okay, but she still seems on good terms with Anita, although she's the one who fired her. I would really like to know what victi who victim number two was. We don't have a report about him or her, though, because tears found on victim number two may be the killer, and the victim two was strangled post-mortem. The victim number one, who, wa who was the possible arsonist from the albatross building who killed his grandson would be and he just said that he hated every one of them and they should all die so the question is did he just say that he hated every one of them and they should just die or is he just so sad and just wishing for it because he's so sad and but doesn't really do anything about it himself so who could have a world war ii gun who knows i don't well then let's just end the night Okay, it's picking up. Case is picking up. So far I have no clue who's going who's it going to be, but that's normal for night two, so but what really makes me uneasy is Oh, okay, we have more sites to go. Yes, that's good. That is good and that makes me happy. I was so scared that we would only have this one 
to give us anything, any information. So, oh, these are the guys who play D&D &D and we know every one of them. So I'm just going to go there. And I hope I don't screw it up because it feels like it's important. <laughs> Although I'm really happy that we have more points of interest now. Oh, small cafe. Is it the same cafe that we've been to? Catch sight of Marco. Oh, Marco again. Hey, are you still working at the cemetery? It would be good to know, too. It's late, but the place is still open. You climb out of the cab and follow him inside. The bar reeks of smoke. Smoking is banned, of course, but some places let customers do as they please. At this time of night, it's either beer or coffee. A man probably about to go clock in is eating a ham sandwich. You smile. It's a real trip down memory lane. It reminds you of your father. Hey, pst. Look over at Marco and head to his table. You and Marco were old friends until he started your wife. Yeah, we know that. Look at you, man. You look like shit. Uh, and you look pretty drunk. He pretends not to have heard. Uh, sit down. I don't want anyone to notice us. He's shaking his voice is low. He's clearly uncomfortable. Marco's a nervous type, but tonight, tonight is different. What are you so worried about? You have no idea what you're getting me into, do you? He downs a glass of cheap red wine on the table in front of him. Sticking my butt out for you, man. If anyone finds out, I'm on my ass. Even worse, they may go after me and they aren't a bunch of softies over there. They're ruthless, real sharks. His voice takes on a plaintive note. Why the hell do you care if that guy worked a diamant anyhow, huh? Admit it, you're just doing it to piss me off. Give me the information. Just give me the information. Sure, go ahead, change the subject. He lowers his gaze. Every single time, man, it never fails. I find a job and settle down, they show up, and you show up and make a mess of everything. Yeah, okay, I know, just tell me. That Jean Breton guy you asked about? Yeah, he worked for Diamant. Jean Breton was the Sandman's first victim. He was the arson guy. He was assigned to the main office, the handyman. He put the furniture together, changed light bulbs, emptied garbage cans. And then they fired him. Got a look at the memo, but it didn't say much about the whens and whys. That's all? He heaves a sigh. No, that's not all. You detect a note of urgency in his voice. He's upset, irritable. That Breton guy, you guy of yours, was a pyromaniac. Got caught setting fire to some boxes in the parking lot. It wasn't the first time they fired him on the spot. So come on, what's this all about? How do you know the guy? I can't talk about it. Yeah, right, it's top secret. Yeah, it is. He stands up all at once, his chair scraping the floor, his hands shaking. This is the last time, man. Don't ask for help again. It's the last time. Yeah, okay. Hey, buddy, pal of yours? He didn't pay. Oh, fine, you pay Marco's tab and leave. The cool air sets your mind in motion. So Breton had worked for the group Diamant and he was a pyromaniac. There's no way that's a coincidence. You climb back into your cab, your head still heavy. The hum of the engine brings you around. You still got a long, long night ahead of you. Wait a second. So he worked there and they knew that he was kind of a pyromaniac. So another thing he burned down the house that was owned by anita did she gain something from that did she bet on it that he would set the albatross building on fire and then maybe she could cash some insurance money or something there must be something going on because camille's relative or whatever dropped out from the investment he removed his investment from albatross or something so maybe there was something going on. Maybe the Diamant group planned something and then Anita had him killed. So there won't be any loose ends on how the building burned down. I mean, that would make sense because everyone calls her a shark. So that would make her capable of doing something like that, wouldn't it? Interesting, interesting. So who's she? That was a good talk with our pal Marco, as always. Oh, it's Perva. Okay, so we had another chat with Perva. And... Hmm... Do I know... Do we know her? Is that... Is that Miriam? No. 
Pauline. It's been a long time. Although it's not really been a long time since I played the last time, but I seem to have forgotten all the faces. Okay, she looks a little bit scary and I think we've never seen her before. Your next passenger slides into the cab and slams the door rather violently. She gives you her address. You start driving. You give her a quick once over. No suitcase, no purse, no pile of papers or tickets, no wedding band and the look of defeat on her face. She dropped someone off at the airport. Not her kid, not her husband, not a colleague or a client. Who? Should I or shouldn't I? You raise your head. Excuse me? Your passenger jumps. Did, did I say that out loud? Her face turns crimson. I'm sorry, I... She shakes her head, apologizes profusely and stumbles over her words. Everything all right? Yes, yes, it's just, um... She shakes her head slowly. It's a bit hard to understand what's going on with me right now. You sense she needs to talk about it, more like she must talk about it. Her voice is warm and deep and has a stunning accent. The West Indies? I'm in shock. No, not the West Indies. Don't worry, it's nothing serious. On the contrary. I'm in love. Silence. She's from an island, but you can't tell which one. Out of the blue, just like that. Whereas I'm usually... She shakes her head. I'm usually the one people fall in love with. I'm demanding, complicated. I always have someone on my mind, but it's never the right person. But this time, this time it was reciprocal. She flashes an incredible smile. She's American, lives in Seattle. She's a journalist like me. She was here covering the terrorists' trial. Our eyes kept crossing. We spent four days side by side. Just enough time for the trial to come to an end, for us to wrap up and spend an evening wandering along the banks of the Seine. Her eyes get a bit misty. It was really cold out, but we didn't even notice. Her smile suddenly vanishes. And I just dropped her off at the airport. There you have it. She pauses. It was short, intense, we'll probably never see each other again. Maybe it's better this way. A vacation romance. You should have gone with her, you think? You think? She watches you for a second. Yes, of course. It's not like I was going to go with her. And what was it really? A few evenings together? A few hours here and there? She shifts her body slightly and seems to forget you. She's lost in thought. You can see her lips move, tremble, form words she doesn't say out loud. Then suddenly you hear her whisper. Go with her. An odd look takes over her face. Yes, take a plane, follow her, find her. But... She giggles. What would I tell work? I can't just... She doesn't bother finishing her sentence. Even she doesn't believe that lie she's telling. Yes, I have time to make up. Comp time, it's, it's the least my editor can do. She pauses. Yes. I mean, why not? She's got a layover in London, has to spend most of the day there. I got, go to the ticket counter and... She stops. No, tickets will cost me a fortune. She sighs. I know, I already looked. The next flight is at six. Her eyes wander. A fortune. None of that was really intended for your ears, but you feel like answering all the same. They'll make a pretty penny of those tickets. What if she's the love of your life? What if? She almost jumps. The love of my life? She leans towards you, wrinkles her forehead and smiles a genuine smile. Just what kind of cab driver are you? I think we often make bad choices for the wrong reasons. Bad choices for the wrong reasons. That's deep. Let me think about that. Her gaze wanders outside to the road, Parisian suburbia and the yellowish street lamps. Do I really need this money? It's money I've saved up to go visit family, but when I'm there I feel out of place. Like I'm suffocating. Where are you from? All the more reason then, right? I would like to know where she's from, but I don't know. All the more reason then, right? All the more reason indeed. All the more reason. She smiles. Seattle. 
She looks you straight in the eye. I have to go, don't I? You nod. Very well. Then turn around, please. As soon as you can, you turn around and start heading back to the airport. Aww. The road is empty, wide open. The last planes have already left and the first ones won't take off for a few more hours. Your passenger watches the road go by. I feel... good. For the first time in months, like a weight has been lifted. I'm glad. Her grin gives color to her words. You say that like it's obvious, like it's a natural state. But a lot of people are scared, they're in pain, they're suffering. She stares at you, a little smile on her lips. And you? How are you? Well, I just got shot a month ago, so... I don't know. Her question throws you off guard, she can tell. Uh, it's complicated. <laughs> the tone of your voice casts a chill over the cab. Okay, I didn't mean to... She shakes her head. We don't have to talk about it. Your passenger is a journalist. Maybe she could help you, give you some information. <gasps> yes! I need your help, yes. You need my help? You explain the situation, the attack, the hospital. Of course you leave out, Busy. You don't talk about the wall at your place, the nightmares, your anxiety. I'm doing my own investigation. Her face lights up each time she learns something new. I didn't cover the story, but... She slips into thoughtful silence as you park in a drop-off spot at the airport. I know someone. She gazes deeply into your eyes. The first plane to London doesn't leave until 6 a.m. I'll have time to call my contact. He'll send you what he knows about the Sandman. <gasps> she pauses, smiles. That name is totally ridiculous. <laughs> and now all I have left to do is empty my bank account and wait for my plane. Time to go. She pays and gets out of the cab. Oh my god, how cool is that? We have another informant. You wave at her, but nonchalantly. She does the same. You watch her as she disappears into the terminal. Yes! Nice! That turned out great. And we are on the corner to this one, so we're just gonna take a look at this. The headquarters of a 24 hour news channel. Oh! The kind that assails audiences with terrifying scoops and news flashes minus the coverage. You climb out of the cab, cross the street, and enter an enormous entrance hall. TVs the size of your car are broadcasting the latest developments in the Sandman case. You go over the reception desk, leave your ID and take the stairs to the 8th floor where Daniel works. The television anchor was a regular customer of yours at one time. He's usually high and is always friendly. Ooh. He'd been off to help him more than once. He waves to you as you enter the office. He's expecting you. You cross the open plan office. It's almost empty. The televised news set is just a few yards away. Without the scrolling tickers and the logos, everything seems fairly quiet. Before we have our little talk, there's something I need to tell you. I want to apologize for everything I've put you through, all the messed up shit, you know, the drugs and everything else. I'm done with all that. Congratulations, man. Thanks. Well, I'm still working on it, but I met the right person, and now I'm sure I'm going to... He gives his head a vehement shake. Whether using or clean, Daniel does everything a lot faster than you do. Anyhow, in your text message you said you had a few questions about uh, the Sandman? I've got some information on the victims, but first, how should I put this? Daniel draws you in a little closer. You can't breathe a word about this to anyone, not a word. If they find out I'm leaking information, they'll fire me. They don't mess around here when it comes to scoops. You either sink or swim. Oh, right, I get it. Just want to know a little more about... Oh! Oh! Mm, oh no! Oh, so Henri Dutilleux, the fourth victim, it was the the article, the news article that we read. It was directly about him. Didn't know that. But uh, who are we gonna go? Wait, we said that we didn't know anything about the second victim. We have the the report about the third one at home, but we have nothing on the second. So let's go about Sandrine Rollin. The young reporter looks faintly surprised. Rollin, the chick from the urban planning office. Daniel breaks off for a moment. Someone is walking past his desk. Hold on a second. He leads you by the elbow to the other side of the office where there's a tiny room with a Xerox machine. No one will bother us in here. Everyone here despised Roland. We all knew she was paid off by the Group Diamant not to say anything. About the Albatross? 
Bingo. She predated the authorizations, the paperwork and crap like that, and she pocketed about 50,000 bucks in the process. You can't help whistling. That's nearly three times my salary. He glances up at the enormous clock overhead. Listen, man, I owe you one, so what else do you want to know? Ooh, tell me more about... Oh, okay. Michaela Blanc, the third victim. Yeah. Everyone here loved Michaela. The kind of international correspondent who knows what's what. A stubborn, hardworking chick. And an incredible woman. She's re she'd received death threats a few days before. She'd get them every so often. We all do, in fact. Not to mention the offensive tweets. He looks away for a moment. But this time it was serious. Dead serious. There's a knock at the door. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm coming. Sorry, you'll have to go around here. It's a battlefield. No worries. Thanks for everything. He stops short, realizing that for once he's been able to help you. A smile plays across his face. It feels funny to hear you say that. You return his smile. Back in the cab, you're relieved Daniel's addiction has been replaced by something more manageable, let's say. At least you hope it is. You turn the key in the ignition and drive away. A motorcycle in the distance takes off like a shot. Bang. You stall a sickening feeling in the pit of your stomach. It was just an exhaust pipe. That's all, nothing more. That's all, nothing more. Okay. So this sounds more and more like someone is going around and um, eliminating the loose ends on a scandal, I suppose. So maybe, I mean, if victim number three was a reporter, she was onto them. I suppose. So I'm just gonna visit this next spot, see what's what we find. Is this the hospital? You get out of your taxi, cross the street and walk over to the hospital. Oh. It's a small drab building with grey shutters. A client of yours works here. You ask about her at the reception desk and are given a floor and a room number. You climb the stairs. The smell of disinfectant is overpowering. Ten years before, someone had come up with an unfortunate color scheme, putrid lilac, sickly orange, muddy red. You push open door 451 and see Jenna sitting on a bed, her face aglow in the light of a cell phone. Oh, it's you. I was wondering when you were going to stop by. She stands up. Is this a good time for you? Sure, no problem. I was trying to get some sleep, but it's been a tough night. She forces a brief smile. Don't have that much time. A few weeks earlier, you'd been there for Jenna. A few words exchanged during a taxi ride, that's all, but she'd contact you afterwards to say thanks. You met up for coffee and then settled into a routine. Text messages sent every week or so to see how the other was holding up. Oh, how nice, we made a friend. Her schedule as a doctor meant she worked nights too, but you never told her about the attack, about the Sandman and Bussy. So you want to know about pancur Pancuronium? Oh, yeah, I do. You nod yes and follow her down the hallway to a small medical dispensary. You can hear the gurgle of a coffee maker. Coffee? Sure, why not? She pours some coffee into a flimsy paper cup, the smell from momentarily blotting out the disturbing stench of the hospital. She pours some coffee into an old cracked mug and leans up against the medicine cabinet. How have you been? What is pancuronium used for? I have to ask. Um, but first, I need to know if... Is it related to the Sandman? She goes on before you can answer. You know I'm not an idiot, right? I know how to connect the dots. I can't talk about it or tell the truth. I can't talk about it. She clicks her tongue. Of course you can't. It's top secret. A cynical smile tucks at the corner of her mouth. The... She hesitates, not sure it's a good idea to talk to you about it, then gets on with it. Whew. Pancuronium is a curare, a poison if you'd rather. When turned into pancuronium bromide, it's a muscle relaxant. It used to be used as a general anesthetic. Used to be. Yes, it's a very cheap anesthetic, but extremely powerful. Too powerful, in fact. Surgical interventions nowadays are much faster and more local. But it's still used in the United States, on death row. Wow. She pronounces the last two words with an almost imperceptible shudder. She finishes her coffee. A lot of anti-death penalty NGOs are fighting to have it banned. Pancuronium is lethal, but it isn't a painkiller. Patients apparently still feel the pain until they pass out. Wow. I... that's all I know. She forces a smile. You have the fleeting suspicion she's holding something back just for a moment. Her smile widens. 
I hope that will be of some help to you. You take a last gulp of coffee to hide your disappointment. The coffee's actually quite good here, isn't it? She breaks into a broad grin. You're touched. There is something about her youth, about the light in her eyes. You smile back. Yes, it definitely is. A few minutes later, you're back in your cab. Luckily, the smell of the hospital has vanished, cancelled out by the cold. You turn the key in the ignition. Jenna's parting words echo through your brain to the hum of the engine. Coffee soon? You wish you could have told her the truth, but... You drive away. Would he have known more if we told her the truth? Hmm, but that's certainly interesting. So, I don't know. We probably can rule out that the dentist husband of Anita has death row medication <laughs> in his office. At least I hope. So we know that it's not something that she could get over her relations to a doctor, I would say. Although, I mean, if she's well really connected to everything, to the whole world in her business group or something, I suppose she maybe could have gotten something like that. I don't know. Strange. I mean, it would have been kind of obvious if we'd now found out too that, that Anita's husband would have had access to those drugs that killed all the people. So it would have been pretty obvious then that it was her. But now it's... I don't know, she's still my prime suspect though. She seemed normal when we drove her, but maybe she wasn't. So Paul-Marie Fragonard was actually our first killer, but it seems in this scenario he wasn't. So let's drive him and hope we don't get killed. It would be interesting though if, if you decide to drive the killer in another case now, they would just kill you on the spot. Next passenger is clearly the policeman. You can tell from his poise, a bit wary with a touch of superiority. Yeah, and he also used to kill a lot of people. Hôpital Saint Louis, please. You nod your head and start the engine. Your passenger swallows a yawn, immediately followed by a coughing fit. You turn around instinctively. Is everything all right? He raises a hand to reassure you. Yeah, yeah, slept badly. Really badly. Terrible cough and... He stops talking. And what? Nothing, just bad memories. Of me killing people. And shooting you. Stuff you can't forget. He laughs snidely. You know, I can understand that people don't like cops, pigs, gumshoes. Somebody's gotta do the job. He nods like he was talking to himself. Yeah, yeah, dead bodies, those are the hardest. Images can get under your skin. Hmm. You've had your fair share of dead bodies. He takes a breath, a deep one. I think it does me good to talk to you. The nurses at the hospital see enough horror and grime every day. They don't need me flapping my mouth. It was 30 years ago, same time of the year. Back then, Christmas started on December 15th, you see. Not mid-November like now. It was snowing, Parisian style, as I like to say. All mud. News about a robbery on Rue de, de Rivoli came over the wire. It was right nearby, so I went over. Didn't run, no need to break my neck on the way. But I rushed. He looks outside, his eyes start back and forth, wavering. His mind is restless. Even from the outside, I could tell something was fishy. The windows were unbroken. You could still see the jewels on velvet busts, rings on satin-covered fingers. I thought, shit, you got the wrong address. When I suddenly realized that those weren't rubies in the window display. They were diamonds covered in blood. Fresh blood still dripping. So I opened the door. The smell of gunpowder and shit hung in the air. I could see the scene from before me, but my brain was incapable of recording it. Like a comic book artist who only drew the main characters. There was spry little me, a robber, gun in hand, with a letter opener stuck in his throat. And a salesman, barely 20 in a corner. It's like my brain forgot the bodies, erased them completely. Eight clients. Two more salespeople. The owner. All of them dead, packed full of lead, scattered in tiny chunks. He looks at you. You ever chopped meat before? Talking about a real piece of meat, no summer sausage. Yeah, so when I was a kid, we slaughtered pigs sometimes. For starters, you had to kill the thing and it wasn't easy. A bullet in the head wasn't enough. 
Then you had to slit its throat. Then we cut it into cubes. I was only a kid, so I watched, helped out a little. The more we cut it into pieces, the less it looked like a pig. Eventually, it just turned into something else. Could have been human. The shanks could have been a man's thigh. They had hair, freckles even, and beauty spots. He lowers his window. I need a little air. He's shaking by a coughing fit. It's nothing, it's nothing. I'm getting all worked up for nothing. That's what the jewelry shop looked like. Pieces of something that might have been human. There was a bit of everything. But my brain just couldn't record it. I was telling me to stay focused on the robber. Your passenger used a different voice as if you were playing your role for a second. So who killed him? Who stabbed him? Your passenger smiles. He's having fun with this. The owner, probably. His fist was still clenched. The salesman, he looked at me and started screaming like a kid waking up from a bad dream. He screamed and screamed. I didn't mean to. I didn't mean to. He killed someone? He looks at you out of the corner of his eye. He did not. He coughs and uses it as an excuse for a dramatic pause. He was an accomplice. A rather brash kid who'd moved to the big city to become someone. He listened to the wrong guy. Became the sole survivor of a botched robbery. The sole survivor in a massacre. It took several weeks before the images finally made it to my brain. It was like the information got stuck somewhere between my eye and sockets and my neurons. I didn't sleep for three days. Blood on fancy suits, satin dresses. A hand all blown up, its fingers strewn across the room. Flesh dented with shrapnel. A limp face frozen in a look of surprise. As for the rest, he closes the window. Every once in a while, all the images come back. Like a bubble. I'm walking down the street, getting ready to take a bath at the farmer's market and pop, they all come back. No way to stop them. Once someone told me I should imagine myself at the crime scene, go over everything again from my point of view. Professional, focused, with my eye on a target. But I don't know how to conjure up that young policeman. His face was washed away with the liters of bleach they used to clean the walls. You should go see the place. The jewelry store? Yeah, go have a look. Impossible to tell if 12 people died there. There's a guard outside, one of those big spotter types. He's armed. That's what I'm told anyway. I, I can't go there anymore. I just cannot bear to see that truly shop again. He takes a long pause, rubbing his face with his hands. It's funny to think that when we die, we take a piece of the world's darkness with us. Who still remembers that robbery? The accomplice, maybe, if nobody in prison killed him yet. Maybe the cleanup crew? Those people will be happy to die and leave behind those liters of blood, the mutilated bodies, the filth. He lets out a whistle between his teeth. With him, he taketh some of the world's darkness. Now there's a nice epitaph. He looks you right in the eye. What do you think you'll take with you to the grave? Uh, I want to tell the truth. I want to know the truth. Lots of darkness. Well, that's good. I think we all need to do our part. Cleansing we sorely need. You pull up in front of the hospital. The passenger doesn't budge. You see the automatic sliding doors? You nod, they're standard glass doors. I think they know who I am and what I carry inside. You turn around and look at him. I'm dead serious, they don't open when I walk up. Here, watch. Someone walks up to the doors, they open immediately. No problem with the motor or the sensor. They work perfectly fine. He pays his fare and gets out of the cab, he waves at you. Now watch me. He walks up to the automatic doors, they don't budge. He waves his arms up and down, looks at you, shrugs, the doors eventually open. You grin as you watch him disappear into the hospital. You drive off. Whew. I wish he hadn't been a murderer. I mean, it, he only became a killer because he was so worked up with his job. His his job was to prevent murders from happening, but then in the end it made him into one himself. Who is... I don't remember very well who that was. 
They think we, we already know, but I don't know who it was. Ah, I see. Yeah, she was the delivery driver who wants to do her own business. Is your customer nice? She stared at you for a moment. Tell you the truth? I can't remember. They're all the same. I'm not in this line of work, you know, for all the interesting people I meet. She bursts out laughing. <laughs> nah, I shouldn't complain, really. At least I can take it easy on my bike. There's no one to really mess around with me. She lets out a silvery laugh. It's very soothing in tone, the laugh of someone you can trust. Do you really like what you do? Yeah, I do. Absolutely. Sure, we don't earn much and the job is really exhausting, but... First of all, I have a killer ass. <laughs> My dates can't believe it. Guys are really crazy about it. All my girlfriends want to know my secret. Basically, it's a win-win situation. But second, and this is what I really love, I'm my own boss. A faint smile spreads over her face. Well, I do have a boss, actually, in my telephone. It's an algorithm. Some guy calls me every now and then, asks me questions, asks me to take on more shifts. But he doesn't grab my ass. He doesn't waylay me in the corridor. He doesn't ask me to be a good little girl and go pick up a sandwich. And that makes it all worthwhile. She looks serious as if we just concluded a long speech. So that, my friend, is why I wouldn't trade in my bike for all the world. And is the money good? The company pays peanuts. But the real tight wads are the clients. You deliver the dinner because they're worn out after working all day. And they don't even tip you a single euro. So, we can go for the last drive of the night. And I don't want to drive Santa and I don't want to drive the cursing lady. She's annoying, I think. Hmm, maybe we can go to the gas station. I'm gonna drive to the gas station, fill up the car for tomorrow. And talk to the guy. Okay. New clue. And that's it. Okay, so let's see who's available for driving today. We all know them. Although maybe he has something new to tell us. It wasn't a long ride, maybe. So if he's got some troubles with the police again. Yeah, okay. We know that. You know, like there was no way I could own a book. And the bastard took the book and flipped through it every single page. To make sure I wasn't hiding anything like hash or some other shit. He flinches something and his features breaks. A crack has appeared. He's trying not to show it, but you see what's going on. You can't help it. The inner struggle. The humiliation. The sense of shame. It's just a book. Do you like it? He looks up. Yeah, it's... Well, it's kind of like a... You know, a revenge story. Like the Hollywood movies we download so we don't have to pay for a ticket. Except that it takes place 200 years ago. And yeah, it's good. It really sucks what happens to the hero guy, and he spends the whole book planning his revenge big time. The guy's pretty messed up. He catches your eye in the rearview mirror. He realizes he's not all worked up anymore. It's my girlfriend who gave it to me. Okay, we already know that. What else did she recommend? Well, believe me, man, it was pretty rough at first. First she got me to read this book, Pride and something or other, some English book. Pride and Prejudice? Yeah, that's it. You read it too? I saw the movie a long time ago. Pause. They made a movie? Shit, I should have watched it. I didn't get through the whole thing, but she didn't mind. After she got me to read something by Balzac, and after the Count of Monte Cristo, she really wants me to read this book. He rolls his eyes. By some Belgian woman, I think. You shrug. Who my girlfriend says wrote a book about his Roman emperor and his boyfriend, and that's really amazing. He laughs to himself. Better not get caught by the cops with that one in my pocket. 
Or my friend or by my friends for that matter. Love. He looks up, his eyes shining. She forced me a little and then then I realized that Monte Cristo, he's one of us. I mean his story, it's luck like what goes on today. But I introduced her to new stuff too. Okay, yeah, we already know that again. My girlfriend, she's a cop. Pretty weird, huh? Ooh, she's 37. She gets me to read books for rich people and she works for the local police. Gestures vaguely towards some place behind them. I was just at her place now. Man, she's one hell of a woman. She drives me crazy. She's so... He doesn't finish his sentence. You pull up at the address given by her fear. He lets out a sigh. You know, man, I don't know why the hell I just told you all that. No worries. Must be a real bummer, all these guys telling you their life stories. Passenger passes you the money for the, t for the ride. I have to go. Punch in early tomorrow. Pause eyeing the time on the radio's LCD display. Or later on, I should say. Moments later, he vanishes into the night. Hmm, okay, so we got a little bit more out of him. So his girlfriend is a cop, too. Oh, we would have been so close to there, but no. Hmm, it's too bad. Okay, well, that was night three. And tomorrow, I guess tomorrow, after our driving, we should get, we should have one of our suspects ruled out. Although, I mean, I have two that I think I'm gonna rule out really early. Two, I mean, one is the guy who has nothing to do with the, with the group, because he just seems like, I don't know, he just seems like an FV kind of suspect that they just throw in to, I don't know, have one more. Because I think that this is like a real big intrigue story that about this whole diamond group and the guy and the people there. Okay, well then, let's go and see. I mean, we have some more reports to read, I think. Yeah, we still have two reports to read. That's... Wait. Okay, first... Ooh! Okay, we have gathered a lot of stuff. Um, okay. Victim number one's death was scapegoat? What? Ooh, victim number two received money to shut up about albatross, yes. I think I need to sort this a little bit before we do anything. Okay, so I rearranged this a bit. Okay, I just stashed everything that we know about victim number one up here. So what just caught my attention was that victim number one's death was a scapegoat. So what does that mean? That so he was just presented as the, as the arsonist. Maybe he wasn't even. So maybe victim number one was just used. That they just, I don't know, leaked it or anything. That he could be the, the arsonist, but he wasn't. And then they just got rid of him. I don't know. Also, victim number two received money to shut up about Albatross. She was the one in the, I don't know, planning office or, any, or something. But she was also the one who had tears found on victim number two maybe killer how did i know that it wasn't hers how did he know that these weren't her tears i think what's missing here is what um what the relationship from victim two was to our i don't know suspects so the albatross fire pushed victim four to sell shares. oh okay no it was after that i thought that it was before victim four changed will two days before death banknotes stuffed in throat camille air to victim okay I wanted to do to put this here. So this is like our pancrimonium stash. I'm gonna rule out Camille here as my as a suspect, as well as Christoph. I mean there is nothing that would link it this to him. I mean we can read his file, but I suppose there won't be anything new about it. So I'm gonna rule out Camille because it just seems like just because she's the heir doesn't mean that she killed him because as we saw it his accounts were frozen she doesn't really she doesn't get the money until the case is solved and it just seems like he he sold his shares because of the fire so he lost trust in the company or i don't know what the change of the will did 
I don't know how he changed it. It would make sense that like the diamond group wasn't too happy that he pulled his shares, that he sold his shares, so that's why they killed him out of revenge with banknotes stuffed in throat, like that was his money or something like that. And I think, yeah, just because she's the, she's the heir, she would inherit a lot of money, so she's a she's a suspect now too. So I think that I'm gonna I'm gonna rule out Camille. And yeah, we can read. I mean, we have time, we can read Chris's criminal records, but I doubt that it will be anything of, of importance. <sighs> but the problem is, I hope there's nothing of importance here because I just used a free space. <laughs> Chris seen your crime scene two months before. What? Because he was in a crime scene two months before? Chris probably seen your crime scene one. Probably. Victims number, okay, yeah, that everything. Um. That's everything there is, right? Chris Escort for Secret Escort 75 West website. Okay, why would that be? New crime scene three days before. Okay, he was around at crime scene and he's working as an escort. I mean, it would be kind of embarrassing if he turned out to be the killer now. And I was like, from the beginning, oh no, just because he's homeless, he's a suspect again. This is every all over. But yeah, I mean, all those evidence that would increase that would have incriminated RV supposedly also were just oh well he stole some stuff before and he was seen then and there so i don't know victim number three newspaper in mouth post-mortem victim number three is the reporter who received death threats okay tears found on victim three as well so what makes this a little bit strange? I mean, she doesn't seem like someone who would cry, would she? I'm confused. So someone was crying a lot while murdering these two, these two women. I suppose, I don't know. Could this also be Alexandre again? But on the other hand, wouldn't he be interested in clearing up everything from the scandal? And this sounds a lot like tying up loose ends here. That she was victim number two was this office woman who took the bribe to shut up and our friend told us that victim number three was a capable journalist so i guess she would have been onto something and probably would have gone to reveal the truth if she hadn't been murdered so that wouldn't have been in the interest in, of alexandra right I mean, it would make sense for him to hate victim number one and probably victim number two because she was silenced by the group. But why then victim number three, I wonder? If she would have been the one to you know, carry it out to the public that this was all a scam or an act or I don't know. The only thing we don't know about is Geraldine at the moment. But she didn't seem like a tough business lady as from as how Anita told it. I guess the most capable, like the person who seems the most capable of doing all those things is like her and she has like the biggest interest in, sh interest in shutting everything up about concerning her decisions. And she has been difficult to investigate, she has friends in high places, so maybe that's also how she got the pancuronium bromide. Who knows? So that's it for today. Oh. Is it that time of the case already? I thought it was night four. Oh no. Pick up your seat sounds irritated. You there? Yeah, yeah. Listen, blah, 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 blah. We already know that. Okay. Well then now I'm interested. So who's falling short? Okay, whatever. Three days. Okay, who's out? Huh. Okay, so it's between two people now, and I am tending towards the well-connected, well-networking business lady, who is described both from friends and foes as a shark. 
So it's night four, but we're gonna do night four in the next episode. So thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time.